I got the other account and I could read it, but I'm, I'm going to use this one. He's going to stumble a little bit. This is a, an account of the burial of Captain John Hyman from New, New Harmony, October 28, 1861. Editor's Journal. Sunday was a most lovely but very sad and sorrowful day here. As it witnessed the committal to the earth of one of our best and bravest citizens, the mortal remains of Captain John Hyman, who fell on Monday last in the charge of the 1st Indiana Cavalry at Fredericktown, Missouri, received the last tribute of the earthly respect. On Sunday, the body was interred at New Harmony with military honors. Captain Hyman was a member, member of the Society of Odd Fellows, and as soon as intelligence was received of his death, the Society made arrangements for the burial. Accordingly, John Hugo was dispatched to secure the body, who, in company with Lieutenant Owen, brought back the body of the deceased on Saturday at 11 o'clock. Mr. Hyman was a man who was widely known throughout Posey County, and the announcement that he would be buried with military honors was the means of collecting an immense concourse of people. As early as 8 o'clock in the morning, crowds of people from every direction began to congregate at the residence of the deceased, which is four miles from New Harmony. And at 11 o'clock, an immense multitude had assembled completely lining the road. At 2 o'clock, the procession started in a following order. First came the New Harmony and Mount Vernon bands playing the Portuguese hymn, which was solemn and appropriate for the occasion. Next came the Odd Fellows in full regalia. Then the cavalry company from Mount Vernon, part of the Indiana Legion, under the command of Captain Milner. After these followed the Mount Vernon Guard, Captain Kiefer followed by Captain Duckworth's Home Guard from Farmersville. The detachment from Mount Vernon brought one piece of artillery, a six-pounder. The hearse bearing the corpse was then followed by the bereaved widow and the children, attended by numerous relations. Then followed the buggies and wagons, nearly a hundred in number, over one mile in length. Never indeed has there been such a concourse of people assembled in this county before. Mr. Gwynn, the chaplain of the order, performed the ceremony, after which the several companies were marched in squads to the grave, discharging their muskets and cannon. The oldest citizens remarked that such a scene has never been witnessed before in this county, and thus Captain Hyman is numbered with the dead. My name is Jim Watson. I was the third great-grandson of Captain John K. Hyman. There are no, there are no Hymans that I know left in the area. Um, third great-great-great-grandson of John K. Hyman. Um, and he's re we recorded that at the Federal Town Battlefield on its 150th commemorative. Um, and he had that flag, that's the first Indiana duplicate flag that was by him there. Um, so that was the account. There's John Kell, Hyman. And Achilles is going to write about it. Clear, cool day. The folks began to make preparations for the funeral of Captain Hyman early. The hearse and procession from town, including the band and the odd fellows, went out to the house four miles, where they were met by four companies of the Indiana Legion and a very large crowd of persons. I'm going to skip so large. Um, mourners and great many buggies and vehicle, vehicles as far as the eye could reach. They buried him with military honorary, fired the cannon, an infantry salute, and the odd fellows closed the ceremony. 3,000 persons present in all. I drove Romeo. Whoever, whatever horse he had was always important to him. He was, he was there with Romeo. Um, so 3,000 people. That's the same day that Gavitt's having his funeral with 13,000 people in Evansville. Um, and he's at the top of the hill right now. More about that later. He wasn't there at the beginning. Um, Indiana Daily Journal, three days later, Corporal Allison in Poseyville, and he's being buried there. His dying words were, tell my friends that I die a Christian and a soldier. The funeral was the largest ever witnessed in this place. It was estimated, notwithstanding the limited notice, that there were over 1,500 people present. The deceased leaves a wife and six small children, mostly little girls, to mourn their loss. So 
Those are the four funerals. And there's Jane. Now she's at home. She's got the farm and nine kids, or eight, eight kids in two weeks. In two weeks, she'll have the ninth one. She was born a couple weeks after the funeral. There's a letter from Jane in this institute, and it's dated October 20th. This is her handwriting. Her spelling is somewhat phonetic. Um, letter, Jane Hyman to John Kell, Rest Creek, October 20th, 1861. Dear husband, I, may I now take my pen in hand to let you know we are all well at this time, and I hope these few lines may find you the same. Lewis is getting well as fast as could be expected. He broke his leg while John Kellen Hyman was enough. He can push himself about the house and we help him on a chair. All the rest is fat and well. This is the healthiest fall I ever saw. We have got our wheat all sold in good time and George will commence overhauling fences tomorrow. It's a hired hand. I have hired Coleman to chop my wood for the winter. I, spent, I sent and got that money from Mount Vernon and I will tell you what I'd done with it. Rob Wilsey was out to see about the note that was due last winter. He said he told you he could wait until the 1st of September, and he said he could not wait any longer for Mr. Chafin was going to sue him. He would have to collect the money off money of you and Seth against court, so I let him have $200 of that money you sent, and I put the 100 that you sent to me in the bank at Mount Vernon. I did not keep any myself. I have been notified of these notes that do against us in the last week. That's, that's what it says. There's nothing missing there. And I sent off weed enough to redeem two of them. They don't want to wait on us any longer, and I would rather do without myself as to have them always sending me word about the money. Mr. Lyons sent out word that he had notes to you to the amount of $190 on us, and he wanted wheat for pay. But I think he will have to wait a while unless we... Will give a dollar unless he will give a dollar a bushel for the wheat. It's worth eighty cents. Now, the notes that I have paid of was one given to Mr. Deeser for seventeen dollars at the other, and the other was at the bank at New Harmony for fifty one dollars. Mr. Mumford is in a sweat about the notes that you and him give together. It is a rather hurrying times I ever saw about money, but they will have to wait on us a while. I hope the war will soon end and you will come home, for I'm afraid I will not tend to these things right. My dear, I'm afraid I will hear bad news from this last battle you've been in. That was the skirmishing outside Fredericktown. I only heard today that you was in one. I hope you're all right, and will come home to me again, for this is a hard world to live in. Our work is all doing well, but not so well as if you was at home. I know when you was at home, I did not have so much to do, and I know you are tired staying away from us, but you don't want home half so much as I want you. My dear, you must come home if you can. If you can't stay only a day or two, for I think the time long to see you. So no more at this time, but remains your faithful wife until death, Jane Hyman. Written October 20th, 1861. That's the day before the battle. So it was never sent. That's why it's here. You don't find too many letters from the women because they went to the soldiers in the field and they maybe couldn't keep them. So, but this one is this one's back there. And you know, this is you know, I saw that letter. Okay, I, I wanted to see who these people were, and now I get a, a, a feel for what the real cost of war is. This is what a war costs. All that debt. She lost the farm. They said they had to sell off all of his property, and that didn't cover the debt. So she had to put the farm up for sale. Uh, you can see this is in the newspaper in Mount Vernon in 1863. But I don't know what happened, because she, she, she got strong here. And somehow, maybe the help of the brothers, the father who might still have been alive at this point, in 1870, they're still on the farm. And all the children, except the one who's married, are still there with her. And these, son, these sons didn't go off to war. She got them all educated. Uh, they lived pretty good lives, and she saved that farm. I mean, you know, she had to step up and, and, and do whatever it is. And there's a, there, there are more to her story because she had to go through lots of stuff to get her widow's pension and her orphan's pensions. But she lost the farm. She got it back. Uh, she moved a two-story log cabin 
back to close to where the Martin Redmond house is right now. That's the, that's the farm in the 1880s. Reminder that those, those are both of them. That's their oldest son, Lewis, who became a doctor and became one of the co-founders of the Posey County Medical Society. Um, Mary Ellen Heim, uh, Achilles, Federal's younger brother. Uh, those pictures are, of course, all here. She looks like she's 12, doesn't she? So this is the daughter who was born after her father died. She never left the farm. She was the last owner of the farm. Um, and Robert, one of the younger ones. Um, this is a picture from 1898 of Jane and her brothers and sisters, who are the ones that are still alive. And there's Jane, five years from her death in 1903. Those are the older children at the family farm. All here. And in uh, the GAR post, the Grand Army of the Republic, the army that fought that for the Union was called the Grand Army of the Republic. And about the 1880s, these, these uh, local chapters, are like, they're like the Foreign Legion of the VFW, but they were Civil War veterans. Uh, there was a post created in, in Posey County, Post 415, the John Kelheim and GAR post. Um, the record book is here, the charter is here, the flag is here from that, that thing. These men were all politically, they all, they're dead. And because they're dead, they've lost their voice. So it's easy to forget, you know, because PSW it re renews itself. This can't because they were Civil War veterans, and now they're dead, and they, they don't have a way to speak up. The remains of Captain John Kell Hyman were taken up for removal to a higher part of the cemetery after burial near the gate almost 20 years ago. Only the bones and part of the uniform were left. She had his body moved because it was buried somewhere at the lower part of the cemetery at Maple Hill. Uh, and she moved him to the top of the hill there. And let's see if I'm going to see that other picture. That says John and Jane. They're both here, and the children are usually right outside here on the other side of this. So, I don't know, 620,000. That's the official record of how many people were killed in that war. Uh, current estimates say maybe it's, you know, statistical analysis, 750 is a better number, and maybe that's not high enough. That number includes men, and, but there were women who killed in the war, too. Um, and I, my opinion, that generation of Union troops who fought the Civil War were this country's first greatest generation. You know, we're calling that, that, that generation is dying now, the World War II generation, the greatest generation. If these folks hadn't done what they did, the other ones would never would have gotten to do what they did. I, I, my opinion is they're the first great generation, greatest generation. And in New Harmony, it's Robert Owen's sons and grandsons. It's Hyman's sons. Uh, it's uh, Thralls. It's, I guess there were some Mumfords. It's uh, Fredrigo's. You know, it's the familiar names. They were still here and still doing business. All they did was preserve the Union and abolish slavery, which is not a bad, not a bad accomplishment uh, with a lot of dead people. So... Thank you.